Hey everyone, I am back. It's been a while. Um, it's been about four weeks since I posted a video and mainly just because I didn't have anything new with the Taxol treatments. They're kind of all been the same. Um, I've been doing a lot of sleeping and um, my kitty's here for this video. And as you can also see that my husband is here for this video. This is Sean. Um, I think you probably saw him previously in my head shape video. So he's back. And we're just both going to talk to you this time uh, because I have finished chemo. So I'm all done. <laughs> I had four rounds of the AC dose dense and 12 rounds of Taxol. And I'm finally, finally done. And we have both just been doing a lot of reflecting thinking back about the beginning of this journey and what it was like finding out um, and how we caught the cancer to begin with and just kind of what it felt like from my perspective and what it felt like from his perspective to hear those words, you have cancer. Um, so Sean is here just to sort of weigh in on the other side of things because you guys have heard me go on and on and on about how I feel about it and my story. Um, but I really wanted to include his perspective because I know that um, it's not just other cancer survivors or cancer, um, what, what would we call ourselves, cancer fighters um, who are watching these videos, but also caregivers, people who are going to be standing by your side and, and they want to hear um, encouraging words as well. So that's what Sean is here for. So, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess I'll get started. Um, I'm just going to start from the beginning, from the beginning of my story and just wherever you feel like you want to interject or say anything, just say however, you know, you were feeling at the time or whatever you were thinking. So um, all the way back in November. So now it is June, mid-June. Um, so all the way back in November, mid-November is when we noticed, I noticed a lump in my left breast. Um, and I was just kind of like poking at it, like, this is different, this is weird. Um, and I had mentioned to you guys before, it was actually right after having an exam from my regular yearly gynecologist. She had done her exam and hadn't found anything weird. And it was literally like within a week, I found this lump. And so Sean really was the one person who, I mean, that I felt comfortable asking about it. And he was like, hey, you've got to go in and this is really important. So. I feel like, you know, if anyone in, in your family that you love or that you know ever comes to you and says anything at all, like that they have a lump or a change, um, whether it's in their breast or anywhere else or on their skin or something like that, definitely push that person to, not in a bad way, but, you know, nudge that person in the direction of going to see a doctor. Um, because if he hadn't been really serious about it, I don't know if I would have gone when I went. Yeah, and it was stage three by the time we found out. So, yeah, I'm glad we you went when you went. Yeah, me too. Um, so you know, I don't know how my story would have been different if I hadn't gone right away, but I'm glad that I got the ball rolling earlier than than later. Yeah. So, so that was kind of our first experience with it. At that point, what like what were you thinking? Did you? Uh, I just thought it's probably just like a cyst, and cancer just not going to happen to us. I mean, yeah really busy at work too so she's like ah it's just probably probably a cyst yeah so it's pretty common i think both of us at that point were just hoping it was not a big deal um and then even my doctor that i went to go see she was like oh yep that's totally feels different than it did two weeks ago when you were in um but don't she said these words like verbatim she said don't lose any sleep over this um it's probably just a cyst, you're really young and all these things. So I didn't lose any sleep over it. It was in the back of my mind, but I, I, at that point, I, had, I was thinking about cancer, but I didn't believe in my heart. I mean, for two weeks from gynecologist appointment to, you know, feeling a lump, it just seemed like cyst, not, yeah. not cancer. Like it's something that came up really fast and it was really hard and really obvious from yeah. nothing to something quite obvious. Um, so they were really in no hurry to do anything about it. Um, and they went ahead and referred me to go have an ultrasound. And what was interesting is like, I remember I was, we were in Walmart together and um, I got a phone call and I walked away from him to take the phone call like privately. 
Um, not that I didn't want him there. He was looking at like fishing stuff or something. And um, so I walked over, I was actually walked over to the, the kids toy section and just took the phone call and they were like, oh, by the way, we won't, nobody will do an ultrasound without a mammogram. And I had heard like horror stories about mammograms and just really didn't want to get one. And I was kind of upset. And I said, well, please try to find a place that will do one without a mammogram. And so that was God working again because they called me back still in the same Walmart. And they're like, nobody will do it without a mammogram. So I had to get the mammogram. Um, and without that, I don't know if they would have found it. So then it was December, I think December 13th, maybe, I think it was December 13th. I went in um, and had the mammogram and the ultrasound, they did both. Um, and like I said in my first video, man, that mammogram was nothing. It was not painful, it was just mildly uncomfortable. If even that, it was just like a squeeze. It really wasn't anything at all to be afraid of. I don't know why I've been afraid so, for so long. Um, I wish, if I could go back and do things differently that I had gone in sooner and gotten one done. Um, and they typically, they don't do them on people my age. Um, and that was why another thing, another reason why I had said in my original video, um, how I feel like we should change that. And it should be something that we're doing when people turn 30. And it's not necessarily like we have to do it every year, but I think when you turn 30, you should just get a baseline. And then if it's normal, come back when you're 35, you know, and then start doing yearlies at 40 like they normally do now. But this, the system needs to change because I've been in chemo for five months now and you wouldn't believe the number of people that I have met that are under the age of 40 who are dealing with cancer. And most of us are dealing with much later stages because no one found it early. So, you know, that's, that's something that I feel like needs to change and I'm not going to stop shouting it <laughs> until I find a way to change it somehow. Um, even if I can just at least bring awareness and attention to it. But so that was my side trail <laughs> anyway. So I had the mammogram, I had, um, the ultrasound and even then they were just like, Oh, it's an area of interest. They had two areas of interest. Um, one like closer to the front of my breast and one in the back of, the, of my breast. And they still were just kind of talking to me like it was nothing. And I told yeah, you, calcification yeah, they called them calcifications. And I told you about that. Um, and like, I honestly, I don't remember what you, how you reacted or what you thought when um, I came home with news that they found something. I mean, I knew it could probably be potentially serious, but. Again, I was just really trying to stay positive and just not my wife, you know, yeah. just kind of just, you know, praying about it and hoping that, you know, it's just a calcification. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, they, um, they told me, you know, they do find these kinds of things all the time and sometimes they're benign. And I remember, so I had to go because of that. I had to go back for the biopsy, which I had on December 23rd. And I remember asking the nurse to tell me over and over again while I was in the biopsy um, that these things are normally benign. I was like, can you just say it again? Like, I just need to hear it again and again. Because that was when the biopsy was when I started believing I probably had cancer. Um, like, it was in the back of my mind from the beginning. But... The biopsy was something that felt really real. Like it was very invasive. Um, it was just personally, it was scary to me. Um, I'm not trying to put you off from having a mammogram by telling you that the biopsy isn't fun. It, they do numb you. It's not super painful or anything. It, it's sore after, um, but it just was nerve wracking to me. Um, and I, yeah, I just didn't, that was whenever I started feeling like this must be something more serious just because of how invasive it was that they were doing this. Um, and then we went home and I started recovering and um, getting ready for Christmas because it was two days before Christmas. Yeah. And we we had a good Christmas. We had a good day. Um, I tried to focus on my kids as much as I could. And honestly, I don't know what you were thinking during that time between finding or between doing the biopsy and between finding out. But for me, like I was terrified every minute of every day and doing my best to just tunnel my thoughts at anything but cancer because I was so afraid. 
that that was what they were going to say. And I even remember like making jokes about it, like that I was going to get cancer for Christmas. Like, not that that's funny, but like I, I was trying to make light of it so that I could focus, focus on Christmas and have a good time. But honestly, I didn't open, like we opened my gifts, but I didn't even open them. Like I didn't open my boxes and stuff like that. Like I just could not focus on stuff like that. I just was so afraid. But I, how was your Christmas day or even just that time span between while we were waiting on results for you? Uh, just speaking of boxes, I just kind of put it in a box and uh, just kind of buried it for the day. Uh, I, I could see it was really worrying you and it's kind of worrying me a little bit. Um, but again, I was just trying to stay positive and just think that ah, it's, it's probably nothing um, I still wasn't thinking you had cancer at the time. I just kind of refused to believe it. So just trying to not think about it. <laughs> so for you, like the next step was our appointment yeah. on the 28th. <clears throat> um, and it takes like 35, 40 minutes to get there. Um, yeah. and we were driving and we actually had, a, we had fun driving in the car. We were really like, talking Joking, and laughing. hanging out. But I remember like, like, I remember it perfectly, the moment and the spot and the road and everything. I looked out the window and I said to Sean, this is our last few moments of ignorant bliss. Yeah. Um, when I said that, like, did that trigger anything in you? Or like on that drive, were you becoming more and more afraid as we got closer to the building? Or were you just still sort of... I feel kind of hadn't taken out of the box yet. Okay. I still felt like maybe, hopefully you were reacting a little bit. It would be a, hey, see, you're... You're good. Yeah. You know, and I don't know. I was just trying to stay so, like, stay positive, you know. And yeah. I know you you know my side of the story about when we walked in. So what's when we walked in? How was that for you? Uh, I'm probably really terrible at telling that part of the story. We just kind of walked in. They sat us down, and but when we walked in, like, and so they had a room where they give you the results. When we walked into that room. We were alone. They just kind of pushed us in the room and shut the door. And there was yeah. like a tissue box um, yeah, on the point. table no, and I'm it had it. like breast cancer awareness stuff on it. Yeah. And so I was like, look, see, I have cancer. That That's the tissue box and everything. Like this is the room where they tell people you have cancer. And even when I was saying that to you, were you still just like, you're overreacting? Like in your mind, were you thinking uh, like- I wouldn't say overreacting is already kind of a serious situation with yeah. all the tests you had. but. Uh... I just still kind of had it in the box. I mean, it's just so saying, you, yeah, she's, like, probably, really she's thought... probably good. It's probably just some some benign something. They'll, they'll scoop it out and we'll be done. You yeah. know, worst case scenario, you have a two-day recovery or something. Yeah. I mean, I know lots of women that I worked with at work or heard through the grapevine that had something small and they had it cut out and it was fine. Yeah. So that's kind of really so that hoping is, that That's was what you. we were hoping for. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so uh, we waited a few minutes. It wasn't very long. And then they came in and uh, the doctor and the nurse came in together and the nurse had this giant binder in her hands. And like, so I felt like every step, like I was just watching it happen. And I, I knew by the time the doctor sat down and he said, you have cancer. I knew that's what he was going to say. Did you feel that way at all, or were you just forward? Um, I missed the binder, so that would have been a good, like, <laughs> you know, situation awareness thing where, oh, yeah, that's probably a, a cancer binder. Um, yeah. I was floored. Um, I remember I the met, look on your face. Uh, I just, I couldn't believe it. I still actually still can't believe it. There are times when I am driving the car on a good day and remember that you have cancer. So, uh, yeah, I was shocked. Um, and then it was a whole bunch of what ifs because they couldn't yeah. give you any more information other than, Hey, this isn't right. Yeah. And that, and that was it. There's nothing else. It was just, that's we what... didn't know if it was stage four. We didn't know if it was stage one. That's what they were was throwing this... around big numbers. Like, yeah. you know, just a little, very nerve wracking. That's what was the scariest part still to this day of all of this whole thing for both of us was that time period between hearing the words, you have cancer, 
to knowing anything at all about that cancer, to knowing what stage it is, to knowing, is it in my organs? Is it in my bones? You know, yeah. has it metastasized? And it took weeks to it get It took tests. a very long time. I don't know if you guys remember when I first started doing these videos, um, I actually, my first video that I made was on my first day of chemo, which was um, January 26th. So I hadn't made any videos about this part of it, about, um, about the waiting and the being scared. I actually did make personal videos about it and maybe someday um, I'll find a way to, to upload them and share them with you that um, I like that I can edit out some of the parts that were more personal for me. But, um, but I will tell you like, yes, I did sit down and I made videos for myself um, to document but I didn't know I was going to do YouTube until I literally came home from my first chemo. And I'm like, no, like, like, I'm not gonna just do this alone. I need to share this. Um, so you guys didn't really get to hear this part of it, but we did. We had a couple of weeks where I went in for an MRI, a bone scan, a CT, um, I had ultrasound on my heart. Yeah. The echocardiogram. Um, so we did a whole bunch of different tests and it just, we were just waiting for each test result to come back so that we would know that I didn't have stage four. Um, and that whole time I'm spending literally every moment at home wondering if it's one of my last moments with my children or with my husband. Um, and that was, that was really the hardest part. Like once we were told this is what it is and this is what we're going to do and you're going to be okay. And I even remember, um, the oncologist saying, I don't see any reason why you can't hold your grandkids someday. And that was the biggest weight lifted off of my shoulders. Um, yeah, that, that whole month, it's a month and a couple of days, we really focused on getting a team for her. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it, you know, our, the first surgeon we talked to, uh, just didn't really, she just didn't have any bedside manner that we preferred. And, yeah. uh, it's actually kind of devastating to hear her talk to uh, my wife. And uh, I walked out of that appointment being like, that lady does not have the right to, to you know, cut on my wife. You know, she didn't have the privilege to do that based on just that one interview. And I say an interview because every appointment we had, that first appointment in my mind was an interview. Are you confident? You know, do you have, you know, the skill and the stamina to do it? You, know, you need to do to keep my wife around mm -hmm. and uh we uh pretty discouraged at that that first surgeon we were and we went to a second and surgeon we did and i'll tell you and i did mention that i think in my first video that I, that we went to um multiple surgeons before we found the right one um but i'll say like for me i i was tired like i just was tired of all the tests I was overwhelmed and I literally just wanted to curl up in a ball and have somebody else figure out everything else for me. Like I was so done. Um, that's how I felt. And I remember that you were that like steady voice that was that you put those things into perspective for me. And you were like, it is a privilege for this person to cut on you. Mm -hmm. And it is an interview. And if this person doesn't pass, then we'll find someone else. And so like, if you, if you are a caregiver or you're somebody, um, who can speak those words into somebody else's life and they're having, if they're in a similar situation where they don't feel comfortable with any part of their team, um, encourage them to find however many opinions it takes. There's, there's, everybody's heard of a second opinion, but you can have a third, a fourth, a fifth. I mean, just don't let a doctor, make you feel like you're not in control of your own body, like you don't know what's going on with yourself or, or like you don't feel comfortable in their hands. Um, yeah, cause even our second surgeon offered a lot of hope and she mm -hmm. had a plan, uh, spent a lot of time with Emily and me showing us, you know, her, uh, images and stuff. Yeah. And we walked out there like, yeah, this, this lady's pretty good. And, but we just had this feeling it's like, but there's something not right. And the more yeah. we talked about it, on the drive, you know, away from the appointment, we're like, this, this lady is not a match. And, yeah, she uh, didn't feel right. Right. She had a lot of experience and uh, there's been a lot of people who really liked her. Um, but I never thought we'd be looking for a third opinion. 
and uh, I was ready to go fourth, fifth, you know, Duke University. Mm -hmm. I mean, across the country, if I had to. Um, yeah. And yeah. ask your other doctors too. Yeah. Because, like, um, it was my oncologist that found the third opinion surgeon who was, that's who we're going with. And she's been amazing from the get go. Yeah. Um, we both feel very comfortable and confident with her. Yeah. Um, and I would not have been able to get that connection without his help. So if you are just feeling like lost and you know you need another opinion, but you don't know where to go, um, ask another doctor on your team that you do feel confident in and see if they can help you out. Yeah. And as a caregiver, you know, husband, boyfriend, you know, significant other, um, sometimes you do gotta step up and just help, help your other one out. Um, I didn't wanna overstep, but there are just some times when she needed me to just put it in perspective. And sometimes that perspective was just black and white. Is this or is it not, you know, yes or no? Comfortable, uncomfortable. Uh, we actually uh, drew out uh, pros and cons from your, yeah. from your surgeons or your surgeons. And uh, that kind of helped us put it, you know, just help to visualize it. Yeah. Well. And, and <clears throat> we, um, I remember doing that when you're sitting at the table and like writing it out. And there was even a moment where I just became overwhelmed and stressed and we had to stop and like be like, okay, we're going to come back to this. Yeah. We're not the yeah. back. Yeah. We're going to, and we're going to come back to this because it's a huge decision and, and you're, you're already and you're stressed out. You're, you're just already stressed so out. overwhelmed and you're so scared. And yeah. even if somebody tells you your cancer is curable or your cancer um, is a lower stage or we can beat this, you still, <clears throat> you never stop wondering if that's going to change, you never stop wondering, you know, well, is it going to metastasize? Is the chemo going to work? You know, am I still going to get to hold my grandkids? Like I hope and pray that over the years, as I get further and further away from cancer, whenever I am free of cancer, um, that it doesn't eat me up inside all the time. I hope I can think about other things, but even still, even now finishing the chemo and having come so far, um, I still have a long way to go and I don't know what's going to happen. And that, you know, that does scare me. Um, but I don't know. I appreciate having you on my side, having you on my team, having the kids on my side. Um, but, but yeah, just, it's really shocking to hear those words. You have cancer. Um, so just like, what what next we found our third surgeon and yeah and we walked out of that that appointment i mean like that's yeah. the one there, we don't even need to call duke university yeah like this is we the just knew we yeah yeah we just knew and we both felt more confident like at that point did you feel like i felt like i had sort of made a turn in my confidence about beating the disease at all like did you feel did you ever feel scared that maybe like that i wouldn't get through this or that things would be worse than they've been or like uh, during that month where we really didn't know uh yeah I, I imagine being a single father and raising kids without a mom and just you know, your mind runs wild I had two friends that I two guys I just texted and called uh several times and I'm not really someone who reaches out much uh but I mean your, your thoughts can get the best of you and uh really did need some other people just to put some sound words into my mind and uh but to answer your question yeah i feel like after we got you know your team together it felt like, okay now we have a plan yeah. now we can beat this now we can know what we're gonna do mm -hmm. and we now we know it's not you know stage four yeah and unfortunately it was stage three but you know the plan like the oncologist in my opinion gave me the most hope because mm -hmm. he was, I mean, he's an older guy, which I don't really feel like age has to play a lot into it, but you could tell he was seasoned. You can tell he had a lot of experience. And he even said, if I can't help you, I will send you somewhere where we will take care of you. Yeah. And, uh, you know, even offering uh, those, you know, trial, you know, clinical, clinical trials. trials stuff like or, that. Yeah, he, he just was yeah. basically like, I'm not going to stop fighting for you. Yeah, he had a good bio you know, biography on his website and stuff. And, uh, and he just put together no, no question was unwanted. 
he always had time for us. I mean, that that's hard to find in a doctor. Mm -hmm. He's always late to his appointment <laughs> because he's giving everybody the time, time that they need. Yeah. I mean, when he's in your in your in your room, you're his only patient, mm -hmm. and that that's what's important, Emily, to be able to ask questions and have that time. And same with the surgeon. Uh, she's just amazing and mm -hmm. uh, has my confidence. Uh, in fact, I remember telling you with uh, your second surgeon, I'm not good with it. Yeah. You know, and not that yeah. that was my call to make, but she needed to know how I felt. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when we walked out of the third surgeon, who's going to be your surgeon. Yeah. I just knew that she and was we, confident. Yeah. We both felt really good about her. And she had a great team for the plastic surgeon. They work together really well. Uh, one of the things she mentioned is that her healing rate is like, it, or her uh, infection, infection rate, rate is, is lower. lower than the national average. I mean, that, that was something we needed to hear yeah. because that's a big deal because <laughs> the second surgeon had problems with that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, just being confident in your team, in her team, uh, I felt like I could vouch for the ones, because I went to those appointments as well, even, you know, through COVID and stuff, we were able to kind of sneak me in there. But, uh, yeah, it, it was important to nail them down and it, it helped that they all work together anyways. Uh, sometimes you don't have that option, but they have, they're all in the same uh, pra not practice, but they're... Some of them are in the same building. Yeah, um, same building. Yeah, but, the, but they're all kind of in the same circle and like all of my... And same network, yeah. Yeah, all of my um, doctors like really respect and, you know, appreciate each other and they yeah. all know who each other are and no fighting um yeah, yeah so they they share information and they just make sure that they're doing what's right for me all yeah. the time um so yeah. that's that, that's that was huge something that's, yeah that's and really important. we need to see that so. um so the last thing i was going to ask you um now that i'm done with chemo um for me chemo was actually i mean it was not easy at all um <laughs> It, but I did not experience a lot of the severe side effects that I've heard about or that a lot of people do experience. And I'm extremely thankful for that um, and grateful to God that he showed me mercy throughout this experience that uh, most of the time I was either just kind of up here in bed. Um, just I remember having a lot of more issues um, in the beginning, being dehydrated and things like that. But just being really tired was my main symptom. Um, and then I did feel sick off and on. My sick feeling was more like um, like feeling just really run down and shaky and um, weak more than feeling like I was going to throw up all the time or anything like that. Um, but you had to do a lot of rearranging your schedule and taking care of the kids and taking care of me or just doing whatever it took to get me, you know, out of the house every now and again or cheer me up, like from the caregiver perspective, taking care of somebody through five months of chemo, what was that like for you? And what would you recommend for somebody else who is doing that now or getting ready to go into that situation as a caregiver? Uh, first thing I'd do is, you know, study your partner or your friend significant other, whoever they are. Um, everybody needs something different. Um, what I heard from the oncologist was, oh, by the way, sleep when you can. Oh, yeah. I mean, he pulled her aside <laughs> on the way, walking off to his other appointment. He said, make sure you get your sleep. He told me to sleep as much as, I, as, much as possible. He said, I mean, he said it too. And I knew right then and there that this guy meant it and we needed to do that. Um, Sometimes you got to play defense for your other. Uh, sometimes you got to step in and say, nope, she can't do that. She's got to take a nap. Or we'll just go upstairs and rest. I got you. Yeah. Um, you know, the whole through sickness and health thing, um, that's just what you're there for, um, at least for us being married. Mm -hmm. um, for a caregiver, like I said, study, study your, you know, the person that you're trying to help. Uh, Emily needed you know, rest, you need sleep. Um, sometimes she just needed a hug. Um, we tried but, to bring flowers in every, yeah, that were never that was dead. Nice. Um, <laughs> little things like that, you know, cheer her up. Uh, a lot of times. The reassurance that you had the kids, like if, uh, if you're dealing with somebody, dead. if you're helping somebody with their kids, I know that you're, but, but just that reassurance that like, Hey, 
you're not being a burden. Right. Go lay down. Like you would tell me, Hey, go lay down. And that was like my ticket that it was fine and everyone was fine and I could go. Yeah. And that was helpful to hear. Um, especially being a caregiver, you're going to have to give up some things. Uh, for me, with my work schedule, uh, kind of shot to pieces. Um, I have a great job that with a you know, great uh, management team that's worked with me. And not, not everybody has that opportunity. But uh, if you can, you know, I filled out my FMLA paperwork, had it submitted, got it approved. Um, was able to work out my hours, uh, me working from home or on the weekends. Um, that helped me be able to give more time to you know, my, my wife and uh, take care of the kids. Uh, we had some phenomenal support from our family. Uh, that That's a huge blessing. Um, but also something I really encourage is take time for yourself. Um, yeah. I'm the kind of person that wouldn't if someone hadn't told me to. It's not that I'm this great caregiver person or husband. It's more of you know, okay, now she's got, the, she's good. That fires out. Well, now my daughter needs something or my son wants something or don't, I, mean, I still got to get this work done. And then next thing you know, it's get up, do, 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 go to bed, get up, repeat, get up, repeat. And then you get stuck in this loop. So one of the really unfortunate things for us, or at least for me, uh, was I wasn't allowed to go in to Emily's chemo appointments. Now, to me, that was just devastating. I think I spent the first two chemo, probably first three chemo appointments in the car, kind of miserable. I mean, yeah, I watched videos and stuff, but it just, you know, really sucked that I couldn't go in. Yeah, with COVID, he couldn't go into yeah. any appointments or any, um, it just depends on the doctor. Like with my surgeon, you could go in, right. um, but with the oncologist, he couldn't. Right, um, so I, started fishing uh little lake little ponds drainage ponds around the area and uh, for me that's always just been a relaxing thing uh something helps me clear my mind and just kind of get up you know get away from the stresses of the world doing that you know once a week sometimes twice and that's important to me uh yours might be you know calling your mom or hanging out with friends or playing a video game um you, you got to do that it keeps you sane because there are times when you feel like all you ever do is help out the other person. Mm -hmm. And while that could sound really awful, it's true. And there, there was times it was frustrating. There was times I was really tired. There was times that I got grumpy, um, but it never meant I didn't want to help her out. Um, so doing things for your, taking a moment for yourself, uh, you know, when you can is important. Um, mm -hmm. Remember to say, I love you. Remember to tell her she's beautiful and remember to give her a hug and, you know, find whatever that she needs when she's really down at dumps and there's nothing you can do to get her out of it. Find out what it is that's going to help her. And for Emily, it was just showing her old pictures of her kids when they were little and it never failed. It was like, the, <laughs> it was like a, a magic, you know, key and, uh, it, it's they important give me something to fight for and right. when i just see those pictures of like holding them when they were yeah. first born that's who they still are to me with yeah. those little bitty <laughs> yeah so that, that's that's all i'm really saying uh you know you do have to take i you know you do have to take care of yourself i had a friend tell me that mm -hmm. and you know he's right and uh yeah I'm yeah and i would really say <laughs> for both both the person going through chemo and the person um, who's kind of helping out alongside or, or, you know, whether it's a mom or a husband or a significant other, whoever you are, um, find someone else outside of this that you can talk to. Yeah, that's true. Um, <clears throat> like, you know, I have um, a, a good number of friends that I felt comfortable talking to, you know, about different things. Um, but my best friend was really just there for me. Anytime that I needed her, I would FaceTime, I'd just sitting here, you know, like with no makeup, my bald head, whatever. And she didn't care. I would just call and be like, hey, here I am. I'm tired. I'm in the dark. And she'd be like, hey, girl, hey, what do you need? And I, all I needed usually was just to talk to her. And um, sometimes we cried together and sometimes we laughed together. But that 
boost helped me get through and it was a it was just another person other than him i know not that i can't tell him anything and everything you need but, more than you need yeah. you need some outside you need help. other support um I, I did she did it was nothing personal between me and her yeah i mean there's just been you know times which just you need to talk to a, a third party fourth party mm -hmm. yeah. yeah um and then like just one more just um i guess tip or piece of advice for you if you um, are in a situation, and I guess you could be either the caregiver or the person going through chemo for either one of these situations. As right now with COVID, you haven't been allowed so much inside the building. Um, but I feel like, you know, at first I just was kind of angry that I had to go to this place every week or every other week um, when it first started. And I remember telling you, I called the chairs, the chairs of despair. Like I was just, I just hated going there. Um, and I did associate it with a lot of negativity, but over time, I took the time to talk to everybody, like everybody. So I talked to every nurse, every like front desk lady, every person in the elevator, like everybody that I had the chance to talk to, even if you're drawing my blood or whoever, like, even if I had two minutes with you, five minutes with you, 10 minutes with you, I was going to talk and be positive and, and speak into this person's life. Not that I'm like so great, but just taking a moment because they helped me too. And I made all these connections that I never thought I would make. And it really did help it not be so sad to have to go into that building because now like when I walk in there, people know who I am and they're like, Hey, it's Emily. And that made me feel positive. I think it made them feel positive. Um, so that was, I feel like really important for my mental health just to, you know, even though I was sad to be there to try to associate, um, the building with some positivity or some positive people around me. So I really did make some good friendships with some of the nurses and, um, I even have some of their phone numbers and stuff now, and, you know, we're going to talk or hang out or, you know, stuff. So homework. it's just, yeah, help them with their homework. <laughs> But, um, you know, just there, there are pieces of you that can help pieces of them and pieces of them that can help pieces of you. And that's why we're all here in this world together, trying to make it a better place. And um, don't let cancer take that away from who you are. Um, so I don't know. I think that's, that's kind of our story up until now. And we're going to keep sharing and making videos. My next step is surgery. Um, so if you're thinking about me and praying for me, um, my surgery is on July 14th and, uh, we're going to take a break between now and then basically just to let the body heal after chemo. Um, and it helps my immune system kind of come back up to where it needs to be. So, um, that's our next step. And, uh, then we will have radiation sometime after that and another follow-up surgery. So I still have a long road ahead of me, but the chemo <laughs> is in the past. So. Um, thank you guys for supporting us. We just really could not do this without your, your love and your support yeah, you. um, in the community. And thank you to anyone who's watching us that we don't know. We're praying for you and we're thinking of you. Um, and we really do hope that our channel, my channel, can make a difference um, in your life. Um, if you have any questions or thoughts or feelings that you want to post, go ahead and post in the comments. Um, and if you could give me a like and subscribe if you'd like to follow along on our journey. Um, that's pretty much it. And we'll see you guys next time. Bye.